Introduction. Alexander Dugin is a Russian political theorist known for an ideology he has formed entitled the Fourth Political Theory. Dugin regards left and right liberalism as the first political theory, communism as the second, and fascism as the third, claiming his ideology transcends all three. However, commentators on Dugin typically identify his views as a radical far-right fascism founded in Eurasian identitarianism, Russian irredentism, a form of imperialism, and a desire for traditionalism and ethnic purity. Dugin also refers to his ideology as national Bolshevism, which he says, quote, represents socialism without materialism, atheism, progressivism, and modernism, end quote. This video provides a brief overview of Dugan's fourth political theory, covering these topics. 1. Dugan's fourth political theory. 2. Traditional culture and religion. 3. Eurasianism. 4. Russian irredentism. 5. Rejection of modernity. Use the timestamps in the video description to navigate the content. Dugan's fourth political theory. In Dugan's own words, as found in his book The Fourth Political Theory, published in 2012, National Bolshevism and Eurasianism, quote, came very close indeed to the fourth political theory, end quote. This provides a useful starting point for understanding Dugan's ideology, while also explaining why he is often referred to as a National Bolshevik, or Nazbol. In fact, Dugan himself was a founder of the Russian National Bolshevik Party in 1993, the emblem of which is shown on screen now. You may notice that the emblem's double-headed eagle, holding a circular wreath, is strikingly similar to the Nazi emblem of a single-headed eagle holding an almost identical circular wreath. Make of this what you will. Dugan's fourth political theory is founded on four principles. Traditional culture and religion, Eurasianism, Russian irredentism, and rejection of modernity. If you're thinking this already sounds suspiciously like fascism, that's not a surprise, since Dugan himself claims to be synthesizing elements from communism, liberalism, and fascism. However, as lecturer in political science Mac McManus notes, quote, the road from fascism to his fourth political theory is far shorter than the road from either liberalism or communism, end quote. Now let's look in detail at the four elements of Dugan's political theory. Traditional Culture and Religion Firstly, Dugan's fourth political theory is based on traditional culture and religion. Instead of modernism, Dugan advocates, quote, the return of tradition and theology, end quote, in which he includes, quote, religion, hierarchy, and family, end quote, values which he believes to have been unjustly overthrown by modernism. Dugan's assertion, quote, it is now safe to institute a political program that was once outlawed by modernity, end quote, indicates his clear desire to return to a specific form of traditionalism. He identifies what he calls the heroes of postmodernity as, quote, freaks and monsters, transvestites and degenerates, end quote, providing a direct insight into the values, ethics and morals of his fourth political theory. Later in this series, we'll notice how these particular anti-progressive views of Dugan are attractive to certain types of people on both the right and the left. Dugan believes that socially progressive people, whom he derides as, quote, the world's clowns, end quote, are so ridiculous that they make traditionally religious people look credible. He supports this claim by noting what he refers to as, quote, the significant achievements of Islamic fundamentalism, end quote, and, quote, the growing influence of extremely archaic Protestant sects, dispensationalists, Mormons, and so on, on American foreign policy, end quote. For Dugan, religious fundamentalism is not only easier to take seriously than social progressivism, but is also more successful at securing popular support and political influence. Eurasianism. Secondly, Dugan's fourth theory is based on Eurasianism, an intellectual movement formed by Russian emigrants in 1921 and which developed gradually throughout the 20th century. Although it emerged outside Russia, it became established there by the late 1940s and became particularly popular and influential after the fall of the USSR as a result of its adoption by the so-called Red Browns, also known as Communo-Fascists, nationalistic socialist populists who revered Stalin and who strongly opposed Russia's turn to neoliberalism.
A unifying belief of the various forms of Eurasianism is a kind of Russo-Eurasian exceptionalism. According to historian Mahlene Lahriel, this is the view, quote, that Russia-Eurasia is a distinct civilizational unit, different from both Asia and Europe, end quote. Lahriel notes, quote, Eurasianism and Soviet ideology had a lot in common, end quote, citing as examples, quote, belief in strong government, emphasis on the organic unity of the ethnic groups of the USSR, end quote. It's important to note that Eurasianism differs from pan-European identitarianism. Identitarianism originated in 2003 as a French nationalist movement called Bloc Identitaire, or Identitarian Bloc, later developing into the movement known now as Les Identitaires, literally the Identitarians. It is characterized by extreme right-wing views, including anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and Islamophobia. Dugan's Eurasianism is almost identical in character, except that it is specifically not pan-European, but pan-Eurasian. Dugan himself says Eurasianism, quote, concerns itself with a class of conservative ideologies and shares some characteristics with fundamental conservatism, traditionalism, and with the conservative revolution, including the social conservatism of the leftist Eurasianists, end quote. Adding, quote, the one thing in conservatism that is not acceptable to Eurasianists is liberal conservatism, end quote. This makes clear the fundamentally traditionalist and conservative nature of Eurasianism. In addition to this conservatism, Dugan acknowledges the Russian exceptionalism in the Eurasian perspective, stating explicitly that Eurasianism rejects both the concept of moral universalism, the idea of universally applicable moral concepts, and the concept of universality itself. Instead of there being a body of ideas and principles which are universally applicable across all societies and cultures, Dugan explains that Eurasianism, quote, considers Western culture as a local and temporary phenomenon and affirms a multiplicity of cultures and civilizations which coexist at different moments of a cycle, end quote. The basic idea is that Western knowledge and understanding of the world is only meaningful within Western societies and both inapplicable and irrelevant to societies outside the West, which have their own unique knowledge and understanding. As an example, Dugan says, quote, for Eurasianists, modernity is a phenomenon peculiar only to the West, while other cultures must divest these pretensions to the universality of Western civilization and build their societies on internal values, end quote. In other words, so-called Western ideas like modernism intrinsically belong to and are only relevant to Western societies. This is the same kind of essentialism expressed by various governments in Africa, which insist that concepts such as homosexuality and gay rights are Western inventions, a pernicious foreign import which have no place in any African society. Often this is expressed in the form of a kind of weaponized decolonialism, with claims that the promotion of gay rights and same-sex marriage in Africa is just a new kind of Western imperialism. The same argument has also been made in various nations in Asia, claiming that concepts such as democracy and human rights are essentially Western inventions and consequently have no relevance or applicability to societies in Asia. This argument has been used by the governments of various Asian nations to not only shield themselves from Western criticism of their human rights and freedoms, but also to convince their own citizens that various civil liberties are intrinsically Western concepts which are incompatible with so-called Asian values. As in Africa, appeals to decolonialism and anti-imperialism are also often made to explain why societies in Asia should not accept so-called Western values. And just to conclude this particular train of thought, so-called Western countries have a different strategy. They often claim to be the innovators of various human rights and universal moral values and take the credit for moral progressivism while then substantially denying these rights to their own citizens or at least making it very difficult to exercise them meaningfully. Then they point to nations with governments which don't provide these rights at all and say, well, at least we're not as bad as those people, as if empty whataboutism was ever a valid justification for anything. In the same way as the Afrocentric values and Asian values movements, Dugan says each civilization has its own episteme or body of knowledge, which is unique and exclusive to itself, writing, quote, the Eurasianist episteme for Russian civilization, the Chinese for the Chinese, the Islamic for Islam, the Indian for the Indian, and so on, end quote. Adding, quote, 
and only on these foundations, cleansed of Western mandated epistemes, must long term socio political, cultural, and economic projects be built. End quote. Thus, for Dugan, in order for Russian society to be successful, it must be cleansed of essentially Western concepts and values, and must maintain only those which are intrinsic to the Russian people and their civilization. The xenophobia intrinsic to this position should not be difficult to identify, which connects it with other identitarian movements. If this was not already clear, it is expressed even more strongly in Dugan's insistence that Russia is fundamentally and unavoidably in perpetual conflict with what Dugan identifies as the West. He writes, quote, Even more important is the fact that the entirety of Russian history is a dialectical argument with the West and against Western culture, the struggle for upholding our own, often only intuitively grasped, Russian truth, our own messianic idea, and our own version of the end of history, no matter how it is expressed, through Muscovite orthodoxy, Peter's secular empire, or the global communist revolution, end quote. This mentality not only ensures, but actually requires conflict with the West, making peaceful and equitable relationships between the two parties impossible. Further information on Dugan's Eurasianism can be found in his 2014 work, Eurasian Mission, an introduction to Neo-Eurasianism, which was published by Arctos Media, a company well known for its printing and translation of extreme right-wing texts. Russian Irredentism Thirdly, Dugan's fourth theory is based on Russian Irredentism. Irredentism is the concept of returning geopolitical regions to the ownership or control of a political power which owned or controlled them at some point in the past. In practice, the returning typically involves recapturing or reconquering territory now occupied by sovereign nations. Irredentism is typically used as a justification for a war which will return the allegedly lost or separatist region to its rightful geopolitical position. For example, irredentism was the motivation and justification for Germany's territorial expansion in World War II. It is the motivation for those Serbs who desire the so-called Greater Serbia, which necessitates retaking territory from several of Serbia's neighbours, including Bosnia, Herzegovina and Croatia. It is also the reason why the People's Republic of China claims territories such as Taiwan, Tibet, Hong Kong, Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia, as well as making maritime and territorial sovereignty claims extending into the territory and exclusive economic zones of Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Brunei and Taiwan. Claims which China asserts are simply restoring its internal waters or outlying archipelagos. In his book, Foundations of Geopolitics, Dugan insisted that the reconstitution of the Russian Empire, which he referred to explicitly as, quote, gathering of the empire, end quote, was, for Russia, quote, a guarantee and necessary condition for the existence of an independent state, end quote. He further wrote, quote, if Russia does not immediately begin to recreate the great space, that is, to return the temporarily lost Eurasian expanses to the sphere of its strategic, political and economic influence, it will plunge itself into a catastrophe and all the peoples living on the world island, end quote. Dugan's insistence that Russia must, quote, return the temporarily lost Eurasian expanses to the sphere of its strategic, political and economic influence, end quote, is an explicit declaration of irredentism insisting that Russia must retake the Soviet satellite states over which it once ruled. Further insight into Dugan's irredentism is provided by his comments on Ukraine. In Foundations of Geopolitics, Dugan wrote, quote, Ukraine as a state has no geopolitical meaning. It has neither a particular cultural message of universal significance, nor geographical uniqueness, nor ethnic exclusivity, end quote. In case this is insufficiently clear, Dugan also wrote, quote, the sovereignty of Ukraine is such a negative phenomenon for Russian geopolitics that, in principle, it can easily provoke an armed conflict. Ukraine, as an independent state with some territorial ambitions, poses a huge danger to the whole of Eurasia, and without solving the Ukrainian problem, it makes no sense to talk about continental geopolitics." End quote. When Dugan talks of solving the Ukrainian problem, he means Russia conquering Ukraine and reducing it to the status of a Russian province. 
Given Dugan was writing all the way back in 1997, it's uncanny to see how Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022 and the arguments Russia's President Vladimir Putin has used to justify that invasion mirror so closely Dugan's geopolitical position. This prompts the question of how influential Dugan's views are on Russian geopolitical policy, which we'll look at later in this series. Although Dugan claims, quote, this does not mean that the cultural, linguistic or economic autonomy of Ukraine should be limited and that it should become a purely administrative sector of the Russian centralized state, end quote, he adds, quote, Ukraine should be strictly a projection of Moscow in the South and West, end quote. The reconstitution of a Russian empire is Dugan's ultimate goal. He writes, quote, the absolute imperative of Russian geopolitics on the Black Sea coast is the total and unlimited control of Moscow throughout its entire length from Ukrainian to Abkhaz territories. You can arbitrarily split up this entire zone according to ethnocultural grounds, providing ethnic and confessional autonomy to Crimean Little Russians, Tatars, Cossacks, Abkhazians, Georgians, etc. But all this only with absolute control of Moscow over the military and political situation, end quote. Rejection of modernity. Fourthly, Dugan's fourth political theory is based on rejection of modernity. It is not enough to reinstate traditional religion and culture. For Dugan, it is essential to, quote, turn toward everything that preceded modernity, end quote. For Dugan, this involves a rejection of rationalism, especially as it relates to religion. Noting with disdain how various religions adapted to the discoveries and conclusions of the rationalist movement of the European Enlightenment, Dugan asserts, quote, adherents of the fourth political theory are free to ignore those theological and dogmatic elements in monotheistic societies which were influenced by rationalism, end quote. Dugan then explains that liberation from the restraints of rationalism will ensure religious people can again embrace, quote, those irrational aspects of cults, rites, and legends that have perplexed theologians in earlier ages, end quote. In a statement reflecting a kind of Russian paleoconservatism, Dugan writes, quote, if we reject the idea of progress that is inherent in modernity, which, as we have seen, has ended, then all that is ancient gains value and credibility for us simply by virtue of the fact that it is ancient. Ancient means good, and the more ancient, the better, end quote. Note in particular Dugan's rejection of, quote, the idea of progress that is inherent in modernity, end quote. For Dugan, progress is an evil because it endangers traditionalism. Thus, the rejection of modernity is essential for the liberation of religion and theology from rationalism and an unrestrained return to socio-cultural traditionalism. Conclusion It should already be clear that Dugan's ideology is founded on conservatism, traditionalism and a passionate desire to return to an earlier age when Russia was geopolitically powerful, when society was dominated by pre-modern theology and before rationalism became a dominant influence. As I mentioned previously, this might already be sounding similar to fascism, though it may also sound merely like a particularly strong form of conservatism or traditionalism. In the next video in this series, we will look at scholarly commentary on Dugan's ideology, observing how he has developed his ideas over time, modified his presentation of them to attract support from both the left and the right of the political spectrum, and identify which forms of political thought Dugan's theory is most similar to. Thank you.